The reason why we either need a false victory or a false defeat here is because we want to up the stakes in the story. And that's the second function of the midpoint. So if the fun and game section was all about chasing what they want or that external thing that they want to accomplish or get, the midpoint ups the stakes and the protagonist realizes that time is running out or that they can't mess around anymore. So it's time to get serious. And the cool thing is, is that we can kind of look to our genre for what this midpoint should be or what kinds of things should happen around the midpoint or during the midpoint. Welcome to the Fiction Writing Made Easy podcast. My name is Savannah Gilbo, and I'm here to help you write a story that works. I want to prove to you that writing a novel doesn't have to be overwhelming. So each week, I'll bring you a brand new episode with simple, actionable, and step-by-step strategies that you can implement in your writing right away. So whether you're brand new to writing or more of a seasoned author looking to improve your craft, this podcast is for you. So pick up a pen and let's get started. In today's episode, we're going to continue going through the 15 beats of Blake Snyder's Save the Cat story structure template. Specifically, we're going to focus on the beats that make up the first half of Act 2 or the first half of the middle section of your story. We're also going to look at how these beats show up in two different YA stories, The Hunger Games and Everything Everything. I chose these two stories because although they're both YA, they're both different types of stories. The Hunger Games is more action-oriented, where Everything Everything is more of a love story. So I think they're going to be an interesting case study for us to look at as we go through the beats in the Save the Cat method. If you missed last week's episode, episode number 47, where we went through the beats that make up Act 1 or the beginning, I highly recommend pushing pause on this episode and going back to check out episode number 47 first. I will link to that episode in the show notes for easy reference, but you can also look it up wherever you're listening to this podcast. As a quick recap of that episode, we talked about Act 1, which was all about introducing your protagonist, establishing his or her goal and motivation, and how their inner obstacle or their inner conflict is showing up in their current life. The last beat we went over in the last episode was the break into two beat. And if you remember, this was the single scene beat in which the protagonist decides to accept the call to adventure that came in the catalyst beat and leave their comfort zone or try something new or adopt a new way of thinking. Before we dive into the specific beats that make up the first half of Act 2, let's quickly talk about the purpose of Act 2 or what we're trying to achieve in the middle section of a story. Act 2 is all about your character changing. So like we talked about in Act 1, the protagonist starts out one way, then they go on a journey in Act 2 and they come out the other side in Act 3 as a different person and in most cases a new and improved person. So Act 2 is the bulk of the story that takes your protagonist from who they are and what they believe when the story starts, and then transforms them into who he or she needs to become in order to succeed in Act 3. And really, this means your protagonist needs to learn a lesson or the main theme of your story. If you don't know what the theme of your story is yet or what lesson your character needs to learn, then I want you to go back and check out episode number 5 of this podcast, which is all about uncovering your story's theme. Now, in order to successfully learn the theme of your story, the protagonist is going to have to overcome or unwind their internal obstacle or some kind of lie, fear, or false belief that they have about themselves or about how the world works. So as an example, if we think about one of our case studies, Everything, Everything, the theme Maddie learns is that sometimes risks are worth taking and that there's more to life than just living or surviving, however you want to put it. In order to embrace this truth, she has to overcome the lie she believes or the lie that says she's very fragile and that she can't go outside because of her condition. So essentially, she has to stop letting her condition dictate her life. And as we're about to see in Act 2, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going to challenge this lie that Maddie believes. So you'll see that in action in just a few minutes. Okay, so going into Act 2, the protagonist needs to have agency over what they're doing. So we talked about this a little bit in the last episode. They're going to be taking a step forward to try to find or get or accomplish whatever it is that they want or the thing that they think will bring them happiness and fulfillment or the thing they think will solve their problems. But in act two, they're going to go about this in the wrong way. In other words, they're going to try and fail to achieve their goals multiple times. And as they're constantly trying and failing and trying and failing, They're going to have to pivot their tactics or their approach until they're finally able to overcome their internal obstacle at the end of Act 2. Now, we'll see how this plays out in both case studies, but I just wanted to set the stage and show you the overall shape of Act 2 before we dive into the details. 
What I want you to pay attention to as we go through the beats that make up the middle section of a story is how these beats put pressure on your protagonist until he or she changes. The plot events in Act 2 and how your character responds to them will constantly challenge their inner obstacle and force them to keep trying different things until they eventually hit rock bottom and realize that there's no way forward unless they make a change. One more thing and then I promise we'll dive into the beats. Let's quickly talk about word count. We're going to keep going with our example from the last episode of planning an 80,000 word novel. So the middle section of a story generally takes up about half of the entire word count. So that means we're looking at about 40,000 words total for this section of the story. But since we're focusing on the first half of act two in today's episode, we're going to be working with about 20,000 words. Now, let's also say that on average, you write about 1500 word scenes. That means we can plan for about 14 scenes that are going to make up this first half of Act 2. I mentioned in the last episode that I always recommend writing between 1,000 and 2,000 word scenes, with the sweet spot being around 1,500 words. And the reason for that is that a 1,500 word scene is long enough to convey what's happening, but also short enough to hold your reader's attention and make them want to continue reading. So just keep that in mind. Now, we have about 20,000 words to play with here, and we have about 14 scenes within those 20,000 words. Just a quick reminder that some of the beats in the Save the Cat method are going to be single scene beats, while others are going to be multi-scene beats. I'm going to explain more about that once we get into each beat, but just keep that in mind for now. If you want to follow along and take notes as we go over each of the beats that make up the first half of Act 2, or just see a visual of what we're going to talk about, I created a worksheet that goes along with this episode that you can download at savannagilbo.com forward slash scene map. So that's scene map, one word, savannagilbo.com forward slash scene map. Now let's dive into the beats. Okay, so beat number seven is the B story. And the B story is the very first beat in act two following the break into two beat. This is a single scene beat that introduces a new character or characters, depending on your story, who will ultimately help the protagonist learn the lesson of the story. So out of our 14 scenes that make up the first half of act two, this is going to be scene number one or scene number 15 in your overall story. In The Hunger Games, the love story between Katniss and Peeta is the B story. And although romance has been hinted at before, this B story really kicks into gear when Peta confesses his feelings for Katniss during the televised interview with Caesar Flickman. Katniss is furious that Peta did this because A, she doesn't know if it's true or if he's just manipulating her, and B, she knows she's going to have to kill Peta in order to survive the Hunger Games, and this whole crush thing just makes that eventuality feel a lot more difficult. But eventually, Peta is going to help Katniss see that there's more to life than just survival. In Everything Everything, this is actually an overlap of the theme stated beat when Maddie's nurse Carla tells Maddie that everything in life is a risk, including doing nothing, and that it's up to each one of us to decide what type of risks we're willing to take. We've already learned that Maddie doesn't take any risks because of her condition, but here we see that if she really wants to live a life and not just stay alive, she's going to have to find the courage to take some risks. So Carla is really the B story character who helps Maddie navigate her relationship with Ollie and all the risks that come with being his friend. So that's how the B story beat shows up in both of our case studies. Now, typical manifestations of the B story characters are characters like a nemesis, a mentor, a friend, a family member, or a love interest. The key thing to note here is that it's great if your B story character can be someone who the protagonist would never have met or noticed in the act one world. And the reason for this is that you really want the B story character to represent the change to come and or the new way of thinking. So if they were in your character's act one life, then why wouldn't your character have changed before now? Ideally, the answer is that they weren't and now they're more permanently in your character's life. The example from The Hunger Games is a really good one here because Peta has lived in District 12 his whole life, and yes, he did have a few run-ins with Katniss in the past, but it isn't until they're both representing District 12 as tributes that Peta takes on a bigger role in her life, and because of that, he takes on a greater influence too. So however you introduce this character or this subplot, just consider that the main function of the B story is to help the protagonist learn the lesson of the story. And sometimes people ask me if it's okay to have multiple B story characters, and the answer is always going to be yes, as long as they're both fulfilling the function of the B story character role. 
And I say that because otherwise, when it comes time to edit your draft, you're likely going to end up cutting one of the characters if they don't fulfill the function of the B story character role. So a good example of this is Ron and Hermione in the Harry Potter series. Both of these characters help Harry learn different lessons in different ways. So neither of them feel like a repeat of the other, and neither of them feels like just an extra character that kind of hangs off to the side. They both have a pretty good and pretty solid purpose in the story and how they help Harry learn the lessons of the story too. So that's beat number seven, the B story beat. Beat number eight is the fun and games. And this is a multi-scene beat in which we see the protagonist really sinking into their new world, and they're either going to be loving it or they're going to be hating it. So they're either succeeding or they're kind of just floundering around. And in our plan of 14 scenes in the first half of Act 2, this is actually going to be about 12 of those 14 scenes. So it's the majority of the scenes that make up the first half of Act 2. Now, because of this and because of the name of the beat, a lot of writers I work with get really confused by this one. So they think because it's called the fun and games beat that it just literally has to be fun and games for their character and that there's not going to be any conflict whatsoever. And that's just not true. Every scene in your novel needs to have conflict in it. Otherwise, it's going to be boring. And conflict doesn't always mean that bad stuff has to happen or that there's going to be explosions or car crashes or whatever. If your character wants something but is presented with two equally good ways of getting it and will miss out on something with either choice, then that is conflict. So I just want you to keep that in mind. Sometimes it's about conflict in terms of what the character wants right now and what they're expecting to happen. I did a whole episode about how to write a well-structured scene that goes into more of this. So if you want to go and listen to that, it's episode number 40, and I will link to that one in the show notes for easy reference too. Something else I want to point out too is that this section isn't always about the character. It's also about how your reader is experiencing this part of the story. So whatever happens in this part of the story is probably part of the reason why the reader was drawn to your story in the first place. So in The Hunger Games, for example, the story is about a girl who goes into The Hunger Games and has to fight for her life, right? So part of the purpose of this section is to deliver on the premise of your story. In Everything Everything, the premise of the story is a girl's cooped up in her house and she meets a boy who changes her life. So this section of Everything Everything is delivering on that promise too. So sometimes thinking about it in terms of fun and games for the reader is more helpful than thinking about it in terms of fun and games for your character. Because reading about a character who's struggling to kind of find their footing in this new world is going to be interesting and engaging for readers, even if it's not all fun and games for your character. Another way to think about this too is that this is a multi-scene beat in which your protagonist is either shining in their new world or floundering in it. And those are your only two options. They're either loving things in the new world or they're hating things. They're either grateful that they made the decision to go on the adventure or they're really bummed and missing the old way of their life. We talked a little bit earlier about how your protagonist will be trying and failing and trying and failing to get whatever it is that they want. And this section is really about your protagonist attempting their initial plan for achieving their goal or for attacking their problem. As the plot throws continual challenges and conflict their way, they're going to keep failing because of whatever internal obstacle is holding them back. And this is why I highly recommend doing the character work before you go and flesh out these beats, because you're not really going to know what kind of situations or circumstances or events to throw at your character if you don't know what kind of internal obstacle or conflict they're dealing with. Now, something really important that you're going to want to decide here is whether this section takes your protagonist on more of an upward path that gets them closer and closer to success, or if it's going to be more of a downward path that brings them closer and closer toward failure. We're going to talk more about the shape of Act 2 over the course of the next few beats and in the next episode, but this is one of the key decisions you're going to want to make here because whatever path you choose, upward or downward, it's going to affect the next beat and the rest of the second act as well. So let's take a look at our case studies and whether those are upward or downward paths. So in The Hunger Games, Katniss is definitely on a downward path. She enters Act 2 firmly believing that her purpose and her goal is to survive the games and get home to protect her sister. Because of her internal obstacle, she thinks that the best way to do this is to train hard, go at it alone, and kind of just do whatever it takes to win the games. So this is the part of the story that happens when we see Katniss undergo training, she undergoes some mentoring, and even a few glamorous makeovers. 
She then has a sweet moment on the roof with Peta when he tells her that he knows that he doesn't really have a chance of surviving and where he also reiterates the theme about there being more to life than just survival. And then from here, it's literally fun and games for the readers anyway, when Katniss and the other tributes enter the arena. So as I mentioned earlier, this is the promise of the premise or the reason why readers picked up this book in the first place. I won't go through every scene in detail, but essentially Katniss's first plan is to avoid getting attached to any of the tributes since she knows she's going to have to kill them eventually and to just focus on surviving the games. So she grabs her supplies and she camps in a tree overnight. The next day, she sees that Peta has entered into an alliance with the career tributes, and she thinks that all of his talk about dignity and all that stuff he said the night before was pretty much just a ruse to manipulate her. So Katniss continues to try to survive alone, but she experiences setback after setback from dehydration to nasty encounters with the tracker jackers. In Everything Everything, Maddie is on an upward path of fun and games. So she's exchanging emails and then instant messaging with Ollie, and they're talking about small things like their favorite books and movies, all the way to more serious topics like Maddie's illness and Ollie's abusive father. Over the course of this fun and games section, we see that it's not just Maddie that needs Ollie, he actually needs her too. Eventually, Maddie asks Carla, her nurse, if she can meet Ollie in person and if they can keep it a secret from her mother. At first, Carla says no, but eventually changes her mind because, like she said earlier, some things are worth the risk. When Maddie and Ollie do finally meet, it's clear that they're falling for each other. After they meet, Maddie starts feeling nervous because she realizes that a relationship with Ollie is something that she can never have because of her disease. So you can see that internal obstacle or that false belief she holds is getting in the way of what she wants. And just as she's about to break things off with Ollie, Carla reminds Maddie that it's okay to just be friends with him. So they don't have to have a relationship. They can just be friends. Maddie agrees, but it only lasts for a minute because the more Maddie sees Ollie, the more she falls in love with him. So they get closer and closer, and eventually Maddie's behavior starts to change. So she's more tired than usual. She's skipping evening time with her mom so that she can instant message Ollie, things like that. Eventually, Maddie and Ollie meet again, and they touch for the very first time. So this brings up a huge question for Maddie. It's now a question of what would it be like to kiss Ollie and could she even really do it if she was presented with the chance? Now, you might be wondering, how the heck am I going to fill up 12 scenes? Well, earlier we talked about how your protagonist will be trying and failing and trying and failing to get whatever it is they want. So this section is really about your protagonist attempting to execute their initial plan for achieving their goal or for attacking their problems. And as the plot throws continual challenges their way, they're going to keep failing because of that internal obstacle, but they're not going to give up. So they're going to try and they're going to fail and they're going to try and they're going to fail. So entering act two, I want you to consider your character's overarching goal and then consider how they might go about accomplishing that goal. And as you write each scene, ask yourself, what would my character do next based on what just happened in the current scene I'm writing and based on how they feel about what just happened in that scene? So based on what just happened and based on how they feel about it, what's their plan? And again, you can learn more about writing scenes in episode number 40, which I will link to in the show notes for you. So that's beat number eight, the fun and games beat. Beat number nine is the midpoint, and this is a single scene beat in which three super important things happen. First, this is where the fun and games beat culminates in either a false victory or a false defeat. A false victory just means that the protagonist has been succeeding in the new world so far, and here at the midpoint, they have a false victory. So they've seemingly won or achieved something significant, maybe even everything they've been wanting. So everything seems to be working out according to plan. But since they haven't learned the theme of the story yet, it's a false victory because their inner obstacle is still there. A false defeat is the opposite. So if they've been floundering around in the new world so far, this would culminate in a low moment for your protagonist. Maybe they seem really far away from achieving their goal, or maybe they even achieve it and it doesn't feel good. So maybe they feel like giving up on everything. No matter how you write it, it's a false victory or a false defeat because the story isn't over and they haven't learned the lesson of the story. The reason why we either need a false victory or a false defeat here is because we want to up the stakes in the story. And that's the second function of the midpoint. So if the fun and game section was all about chasing what they want or that external thing that they want to accomplish or get, the midpoint ups the stakes and the protagonist realizes that time is running out or that they can't mess around anymore. So it's time to get serious. 
And the cool thing is, is that we can kind of look to our genre for what this midpoint should be or what kinds of things should happen around the midpoint or during the midpoint. So for example, in a romance story, this is when the relationship kind of amps up. So depending on the heat level, this could be a first kiss. It could be two people sleeping together, a marriage proposal, someone saying they love you, or just anything like that that takes the story to the next level. In something like an action or a horror story, this could be some kind of ticking clock that gets introduced into the plot. So whatever happens maybe gives rise to some kind of deadline by which the protagonist has to act. So it ups the stakes. In a mystery or a thriller, this could be a really fun plot twist where readers and the protagonist realize that they don't even really know half the story yet and that there's still all this other stuff to learn. It could also be something that happens that nobody saw coming and kind of just puts pressure on your protagonist. So it could up the stakes in that way. So if you do get stuck here, you kind of just want to think about stories that are in the same genre as yours and say, okay, so what did they do to up the stakes and how could I do something similar? So that's the second function of the midpoint, to up the stakes. The third function of the midpoint is to cross the A and B stories. So the A story is your external plot. It's whatever is happening in the external world. The B story is the inner character journey, which is represented really by that B story character or that subplot. It's that inner journey they need to go on. So because of this, the midpoint often changes the direction that the story is headed in. This is also where the protagonist might shift away from chasing their wants or letting go of that thing they want in order to start figuring out what they need. And just know that this is not all going to happen in one scene. I'm just saying that the shift usually starts to happen here. So they start shifting away from that thing that they want and they start going after that thing they need, even if they're kind of going after it unconsciously. So no matter what happens, this is really where the protagonist realizes that things haven't been working out, so they have to either change their tactics or their plans again. And because you've upped the stakes, it's now even harder for them to go back to their old world or who they were in Act 1. And this is really what that advice means to keep upping the stakes. You want to keep upping the stakes so that your protagonist has to complete their arc of change, and so it's not easy for them to turn around and just go back home and forget the whole thing. So if we look at our two case studies, in The Hunger Games, this is where Katniss is kind of suffering these major hallucinations and she staggers and falls to the ground. She knows that the career tributes are pretty darn close behind her and she sees Peta running towards her through the trees. But instead of stabbing her with his spear, he gets her up and he tells her to run. So the stakes are raised here and the A and B stories cross when Katniss realizes that Peta just saved her life. So maybe he isn't just manipulating her for the sake of the game. Maybe he really does care and he does have feelings. This is also a false defeat moment because Katniss and the readers know that both Peta and Katniss can't win. So for Katniss, it's kind of like, what's the point of loving someone who's going to have to die in order for me to survive? And what Katniss is going to learn is the theme of the story or that there's more to life than just surviving the games. There's more important things. This is also where we see Katniss shift tactics because after Peta kind of saves her, she decides that her best chance of survival is to join forces with some of the other tributes. And this is interesting because, again, she hasn't learned the lesson of the story. So in her mind, she's kind of thinking, okay, I'm going to join forces with the other tributes. But in the end, I still plan on surviving alone because as far as she knows, only one person can win. In Everything Everything, this is when Maddie and Ollie kiss for the very first time. And this is a false victory because just a few pages later, Ollie gets in a big fight with his dad and his dad physically abuses him. So Maddie runs out the front door and she tries to help Ollie, even though her mom is in the house screaming at her to stay inside because of her illness. So essentially, she's risking her life for Ollie here. And when it's over, Maddie's mom realizes that this boy that moved in next door is not actually a stranger to her daughter. So they're close. They know each other. And Maddie just kind of continues to lie about the whole thing. So this is definitely up the stakes for Maddie, and it in a way shifts her from kind of pursuing this thing that she wants, which is a relationship with Ollie, to almost starting to challenge her mother and this lie that says she has to be inside all the time. So that's beat number nine, the midpoint moment, and that wraps up part one of the middle beats of the Save the Cat method. I'm going to be doing at least two more episodes where we walk through the beats that make up the second half of the middle and then the beats that make up the end of a story as well. So stay tuned for that if you're interested in this method. But for now, let's recap the beats we just went over that make up the first half of the middle section of your novel. 
And remember that if you're using the same math that I used as an example, this is going to be about 20,000 words and about 14 scenes at 1,500 words a piece. The first thing we talked about is the overall purpose of Act 2, and really it's all about forcing your character to change. So the whole of Act 2 is the bulk of your story that takes your protagonist from who they are and what they believe when the story starts and transforms them into who he or she needs to be in order to succeed in the third act. So the first beat we went over is beat number 7, and that's the B story. And this is just a single scene beat that introduces a new character or characters, depending on your story, who will ultimately help your protagonist learn the lesson of the story. And remember that with each one of these beats, this has to be a complete scene. So it's not just introducing a character, it's introducing a character in the context of a scene. Beat number eight is the fun and games beat. And this is a multi-scene beat in which we see the protagonist really sinking into their new world and they're either going to be loving it or they're going to be hating it. They're going to be succeeding or they're going to be floundering and kind of flailing around. And as we talked about earlier, this is the promise of the premise. So we're really showing readers here what they picked up your novel for. And even if it's not fun for your character, it's definitely going to be fun for your reader. In our roadmap of 14 scenes for the first half of the middle, this would take up about 12 of those 14 scenes. Beat number nine is the midpoint, and this is a single scene beat in which three super important things happen. So first, this is where your fun and game section culminates in either a false victory or a false defeat. Second, this is where we up the stakes for your protagonist and make it even harder for them to go back to who they were in the Act 1 world or to just turn around and go back, period. And the third function is to cross your A and B stories, so to kind of help your protagonist start to shift away from that external thing that they want and to start pursuing the thing that they really need that will really bring them happiness and fulfillment or completion or whatever it is that they really need. As a reminder, if this structure resonates with you, there are a few really fantastic books that you can check out that I will link to in the show notes for you. My personal favorite is Save the Cat Writes a Novel by Jessica Brody, but there's also the original Save the Cat book by Blake Snyder too. Both are awesome and both go into way more detail than I can do here. And if this structure doesn't resonate with you, that's okay too. There's no right way to plot out a novel. Either way, I hope you enjoyed this episode and that it got the creative juices flowing. If you want to download the freebie that goes along with this episode, you can head over to savannagilbo.com forward slash scene map. So that's scene map, one word, savannagilbo.com forward slash scene map. So that's it for today's show. As always, I want to thank you so much for tuning in and showing your support. If you want to check out any of the links I mentioned in this episode, you can find them over at savannagilbo.com forward slash podcast. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to the show because there's going to be another brand new episode coming out next week. If you're an Apple user, I'd really appreciate it if you took a few seconds to leave a quick rating and review. Your ratings and reviews tell iTunes that this is a podcast that's worth listening to. And in turn, that helps this show get in front of more fiction writers just like you. So that's it for today's show. I'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Until then, happy writing.